Life with Liliana and Friends. Hola everyone and welcome to Life with Liliana and Friends. We are on our final episode already. We are still talking about the same topic, greener pastures. And as you will remember, we've spoken to a lot of great guests, really just my friends and family. And the whole point of these conversations is that we can learn from each other. We can be encouraged by other people's experiences just through everyday stories. Now, this evening, I am really happy to be able to speak to my ex-husband, Lysia Satora. He is currently based in Manila. He's been living and working overseas since 2014. And his field of expertise is in economics. And he is currently, excuse me while I read this because it's a bit of a mouthful, he is currently the Senior Public Management Specialist for Central and West Asia region. And he will be stationed in Pakistan for the next three years. And he's had quite a journey. His wife and uh, children, Andrea and the two beautiful kids, are based in uh, Tonga at the moment. And he also, which is a little bit different to the other guests, he also has quite a huge um, responsibility in his uh, village. So he is the head of the uh, Tokatoka Natunia Rawa um, in Nat- Natalau Sambeto. So he has got a very interesting angle that he's coming with. Lai, thank you so much for making time for Life with Liliana and Friends. Thank you for having me on um, your show, Liliana. Well, thank you for coming. So I know that you're very busy, and so we do appreciate the time that you're taking to come on to the show. So I want to just start, because we don't have a lot of time, and like there's so much that you can talk about of your, about your experience, right? So can we start from when you first went overseas? Can you remember what it was like, what your expectations were, what your experience was like? Could you share that with us? Sure. So I, as you as you mentioned, I first left for Manila about eight years ago, and I've been um, sort of living abroad uh, on and off for the for the last eight years. Um, in terms of um, you know sort of insights that I can share, the first um, is um, you know one I think that's common to most of the people you interviewed, and that's just the adjustment. When you arrive, everything's new and exciting. Um, you know, you're keen to explore the, the the new country that you're in, meet new people, you know, try the food. Uh, Manila is much bigger than Fiji, so you know it's all the, the differences eh, that are quite exciting. Um, and you're and you're seeing everything through rose tinted glasses. But then eventually the the excitement wears off, and you have to settle into the the sort of day to day, you know, business of life in your new country, you know, things like paying rent, paying the bills, um, adjusting to work, um, um, you know, getting used to your new colleagues and things like that. And it's at that point where you sort of realize that um, the level of access you had to your support group or your support network isn't isn't there anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in Fiji, for example, you know, leaving aside technology and social media and things like that. If you're, uh, you know, in a situation where you just want to vent or you just want to distress or things like that, you can just stand up and walk. Walk outside your door within 15 to 20 minutes, you meet a relative or a friend and and it's, you know, so that, that, that level of access is there. When you're abroad or when you're living in a new country, you find that, uh, you know, you don't have the same level of access and it's, you, you do form new friendships and you have colleagues that you're quite close to, but just planning to meet up can, can be quite difficult because, you know, you're, you, um, that level of pro- the proximity is not, not there anymore. In Manila in particular, the traffic's, you know, really terrible. So, for example, you might want to meet for, for lunch um, and it'll take an hour, but getting there is an hour and a half and getting back is two hours. So you really have to be, you really have to plan for these things. And sometimes it's just not, you find that it's just not worth it. Mm. So that would be the, the biggest adjustment, just the, the disconnect from your, your support group and network. Mm. And I suppose the other major um, lesson, and this might be more unique to me actually, 
is um, proving to yourself that you deserve to be there. Uh, in my first year after, you know, my, my first year in Manila, or working for ADB in Manila, I, um, you know, I was constantly hyper alert and, and hyper tuned to the feedback I was getting on the work that I was producing. Yeah? And I had a huge monkey on my back in terms of um, believing that I was good enough to be there and good enough to be a professional in, in uh, ADB. And um, um, it took a it took a while for me to you know uh, to recognize that um, you know your 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 superiors have um, have identified that potential in you. They they view you as someone who's um, competent and capable of adding value to the the goals of the organization. And they've actually invested in you. So they've brought you from Fiji to Manila um, to do a job. And, um, you know, as far as they're concerned, you're, you've been given all the, the tools you need to, to then do that job. And um, all the hang-ups are really in your head. Um, so it's, it's something that I've, uh, that I've really need to, that I really, I've really needed to learn to, uh, to deal with. Yeah. So, those are such great uh, insights, Lai. Thank you for sharing those. I like particularly the last one at the professional side because you're right. I don't know whether it's unique to you or it would be something that, you know, professionals who go across feel. And I just had a question around that. So do you think that is because you are surrounded by, because I know that in ADB what the environment is like, right? Highly educated, highly experienced workforce um, I was wondering whether you thought that feeling came from the people that were surrounding you or it was a personal thing that you came in with somehow. Were you able to identify that? Yeah, I, th I think I got the, the sense of it. And I think you're, you're right. That's one of the contributing factors. Eh? You're sort of in a new country working for an international organization. Your colleagues are all very accomplished, impressive people. Eh? And from nationalities or countries that are far more developed than Fiji. So sometimes it's easy to feel like you're a fish out of water um, or you don't, you don't uh, deserve to be there. Um, you're used to wearing bullet shirts. They're used to wearing business suits, suit and tie. Um, and, you know, they're all very just impressive. Um, so that's part of the adjustment to, I suppose, you have to make, the, you know, that the fact that you're, you're just as good as uh, as they are, and um, it's it's getting rid of that maybe what you could call it inferiority complex eh? because you're coming from a much smaller country, um, and um, and believing that you can make a difference not make a difference but you can you can pull your own weight. Yeah. Um, if, um, like I said, you're from a much uh, smaller country, and uh, and a much more and a much uh, more different. Uh, context. That's great. And I, I'm thankful that you shared that lie. And I just, I hope that encourages somebody today, because if you feel like that, it's normal. But I guess what's important is for us to find ways to overcome that and not just leave it to fester, because I believe the next thing is that it'll start to affect your performance. But we're going to move on shortly from that lie. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. Viewers, we're going to take a quick break. Let your friends and family know that there's a great conversation going on, and we will see you very shortly. Binaka. Life with Liliana and Friends. Life with Liliana and Friends. Welcome back. So we're still talking to Light Tora, and he's talking to us about his experience as a professional based overseas, living and working in Manila, soon to be in Pakistan. So Lai, one thing that has been consistent with the, the conversations that we've had so far is the responsibility that we have to support those back home. Now, you have a lot of responsibilities. So would you mind talking us through what that looks like for you and how you've been able to navigate through that while being overseas? So the support that I, um, that I provide for the, um, those at home, you can sort of group into three broad categories. The first, support for immediate and extended family, and that involves sending money home for household expenses, bills, things like that. 
um, our traditional commitments as a as a clan and as a family. Um, medical expenses, you know, education expenses. And we also have, um, you know, two or three development projects in uh, in the works. And so that absorbs quite a, a great deal of, you know, the, the support that I do uh, provide. Then the second group is, um, of course, the, the village, the church and Vanua commitments. And as an elder in the village that um, entails also, you know, contributing to those things. For example, right now, we're preparing our youth group uh, for seasonal labor work overseas. And um, for me, that's meant sending money for just to get the documentation in order, passports, um, medical clearance, police clearance, things like that. We have another group that's um, uh, working on food security, and um, that'll mean sending money home for you know, just to hire a tractor to plow the land so that they can start planting all these um, root crops uh, for each uh, household. Mm -hmm. And then you have your church commitments and your your broader, your wider than all commitments. And then I suppose the third category is, um, maybe you could call it miscellaneous. It's these ad hoc requests that you get from family and friends for financial support. And, um, you know, if it's within my means, I'm more than happy to help her. And I think it it segues nicely into what will into my final point, which is like for me the the support that I provide isn't a burden. Um, I'm more than happy to to contribute, and for me it's I'm privileged to be in a position where I'm able to comfortably discharge these responsibilities or to provide this support. And um, it's an extension of um, you know the rich legacy that my grandparents and my parents have, have left behind for the family to uphold mm. um, and so it's um, like I said it's um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to to be in a position to be able to do that mm. and then my brother and I are always joking around that um, the more you give, the more you receive. Eh? And so it might uh, seem sometimes like you're stressed out providing or contributing to the to, to various things, but um, the, the blessings you get is, is multiplied. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the sort of philosophy that, that we live by. That's good. I really like that. And it's not a joke. It's uh, the word of God, which is great. So you... I don't know whether you watched the one with mom and she spoke about sowing sparingly. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And so I really love those examples that you gave. And one of the things that struck me was the development initiatives that you're doing. Because I think sometimes we quite often forget that uh, while we want to support, we want people to, we want to leave a legacy. You touched on that. I want to ask for you in particular, you know, you've talked about food security, you've talked about other little projects that you're doing with um, Levi and the guys in the village. What legacy are you, would, are you working towards? What are you leaving? If you could just say one, because I know there's a lot of stuff. The main thing would be that, um, you know, we all rise with the tide. Eh? I think my father was the Turangnia of our village for 42 years, 42 years. Um, and in that time, he was able to take the level of development in our village to sort of new heights. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, the sort of legacy that he's left for us. And so um, my older brother, Meli, and I, and um, our siblings are doing everything we can to try um, and maintain that. One of the things I think he wasn't able to um, accomplish before he passed away was you know, to make sure that um, every single member of our village or our community was also reaping the benefits of that development. Eh? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we've been able to identify is just the lack of education and and all that entails. You know, if you're not educated, you're essentially, yeah. you have a day-to-day -day mindset. You know, it's, it's none of this um, thinking about, you know, how, how can I um, improve my living conditions or how can I, um, you know, find work and that'll give me the income or lively income I have to improve my life to, to improve the, the, my, my prospects or the prospects for my children and things like that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Lai. We're going to take a quick break. I love that you ended on that on education and that you also have Tutu Ameli with you, who's, 
you know, an education or be a teacher and a head teacher, and he's um, been in that space for a long time. So, man, great, great conversation so far. Thanks, Life, for sharing that. We'll take a, that quick break, and we'll be back for the final segment of the show. I'll see you shortly. Life with Liliana and Friends. Life with Liliana and Friends. Welcome back. We're speaking with Life Torah, and I hope you've managed to catch the first uh, part of this conversation. Life, thank you for sharing so many insights with us. We just need to, you know, there's so much more we can talk about. But what I'd really love at this time is if you could share some lessons, some key lessons that you've learned that's just going to help that other person from whether it be a professional, from a professional perspective, if people are thinking or they're planning or preparing to go overseas for a role, you know, in the, from the professional, from a, on a, from a profe- professional standpoint, sorry, but also on the personal side, because you spoke at length about dealing with, you know, the responsibilities from the Vanua and also family. What are some key lessons you can leave with us? I think a couple of insights. The first is, um, you know, if you're in a position where you're considering uh, an opportunity to go work overseas professionally, or you're you're working you're working towards that particular goal, it's important to to remember who you are. Um, to remember that um, you know these opportunities they don't they don't come by every day. They're very difficult to to um, to to come by. And off, more, you know, more often than not, the, the combination of um, all your hard work and sacrifice and dedication, and and um, and beyond you, the family, the the support that your family and your friends uh, have provided you with. Um, and so you're in a position now where your organization believes that you have what it takes to, like I mentioned earlier, to add value to the goals of the the organization. Um, and so. It's natural to to feel anxious or to feel some level of trepidation, but um, you know the I think the the journey there and your and your life um, in a in a new environment and just the whole experience and exposure that you get will be well worth it. And the one of the 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 best things about it is that you can bring it back to your home or to your community. Um, and, and and also add value in in um, in that respect. The I suppose the second insight is um, you need to also be very structured and intentional about um, your 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 arrangements and your communication with your family, yeah? especially if you'll be sending money back, or if in my case you're involved in uh, village development projects and things like that. And, um, you know, what I've, what I've found is that even with the latest advancements in technology, with social media, with Zoom, um, you, 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 you try and um, you, you schedule meetings and things like that to try and follow up on discussions you've had. If everyone's uh, not intentional about the whole thing, if they're not committed, then these, these are just tools. Eh? The, if you're not using them, they're, the useless, um, and uh, so as I, um, the, the more experience I get in this situation, uh, the more I'm making sort of tweaks here and there to account for the fact that uh, that things don't happen perfectly. Mm-hmm. So uh, whereas I was hoping for weekly Monday meetings with uh, the other elders in the village. Now it's Sunday afternoon, you know, after everyone's had a chance to have lunch and rest and then uh, half an hour to an hour max. Um, and then you know, it's, that's, those, are the, those are the kinds of things you need to be really pragmatic about. Right. I like that because what I'm also hearing is that you learn as you go and things might not work and don't be so set in your ways that you don't want to change. So seeing what works, adjusting to make it work. Just one last thing. What about because you have um, you're not in the same country as your family, and that must be difficult. How do you, um, as a family, how are you able to keep in touch with the kids, with Andrea, and and how can for those who might be in similar situations? What is some advice that you can give? I think the um, the main thing is um, 
you know, making use of these um, of um, these tools that we have, Messenger, Zoom. Um, in my case, it's it's Messenger, and it's um, every afternoon or you know whenever something exciting happens um, in Tonga um, at home in Tonga, then uh, you know we're constantly you know communicating and. And um, and uh, so I'm being so I'm also part of that experience. Eh? In fact, I haven't seen my family now in about uh, at least two years mm-hmm. um, because of COVID and because of the border lockdowns now. And uh, so that's so being able to have that kind of access to them is a is a real blessing. And thank you for that, Lai. Sadly, we've come to the end of the show already, but you've given us so much to think about, and I really. Also appreciate you sharing the side of the from the Vanua and your responsibilities there because that's a different angle that we also haven't seen in the show. But I wanted to thank you and let you know that you're appreciated. I'm sure not only by us and your also your family in Tonga, but also um, your family back in the village. And we are looking forward to having you back on the show again. So please accept our invite. Next time, I'm giving you the heads up that we still have to unpack this story a lot more and there's a lot more angles, but we wish you all the best in your next posting in Pakistan and thank you so much for joining Life with Liliana and Friends this evening. Yeah, thank you, Liliana. Pleasure. And to our viewers, well, that's a wrap. That's the end of the premiere season of Life with Liliana and Friends on My TV. We have loved this ride and we will be back at a later date Um, please keep a lookout on our Facebook page for when the next shows will be we'll be doing some shows before we come back onto my TV so get excited for that but thank you so much and we will see you next season life with Liliana and friends 